Okay, welcome everyone for the first um, NA3RC and IQ um, Microphysiological Systems um, webinar. This is the first of a series of both webinars and workshops. And today we're going to be focused on the subject of liver toxicology. As a disclaimer, um, this webinar and this workshop series is made up of companies who may be competitors and or customers of each other. Accordingly, nothing discussed during this webinars and workshops are intended to result in an agreement on price, exclude suppliers from any market, or otherwise restrain competition. Those participating in this webinar and workshop series are instructed to avoid discussion of competitively sensitive subjects, including costs, prices, sales, product marketing, and other confidential information. In addition, neither NA3RC nor the IQ will use contact information received during this collaboration or this workshop series for marketing purposes or engage in marketing or sales conduct during these activities. Just a short disclaimer to make sure we are all on the same page. So for those of you that are participants in this webinar, um, we do not have um, your cameras or your microphones on just to avoid um, the possibility of distracting noises. Um, so what you will need to do um, when it gets to the Q&A or if you want to use the chat is just go up to the top, there'll be a little chat um, bubble and then it will pop out a little um, chat box for you to put your questions in. Um, the questions we will actually take at the end of the two panel speakers um, as time permits. So just a little introduction to who we are hosting this webinar. It is co-hosted or it's primarily hosted by the NA3RC, but in collaboration with the IQ. The NA3RC is a nonprofit whose mission is to advance science, innovation and research animal welfare. And we do this through collaborative 3Rs efforts. We try to make these collaborations as diverse as possible. And so we're really excited um, today on the webinar to have both the end users and technology providers, as well as academics um, on the call today. This is a picture of just our leadership team and board of directors, as well as their institutional logos. And I hope that you can appreciate that we do really try to make this um, um, nonprofit diverse. We look for initiatives that have ample um, evidence of being a strong 3R strategy that will make big impact in the field and ultimately are practical um, to implement. And so we truly believe that the microphysiological systems um, fall into this category. We think they have strong evidence, will make a big impact and will be practical. And so our initiative seeks to increase adoption and regulatory acceptance um, of MPS in coordination with animal studies. Our um, NA3RC MPS initiative includes 40 different institutions, 28 who are developers. Um, so thank you to all of those who are involved in our initiative. And we do focus on four key efforts. So we work on interfacing with end users. This call is um, the result of that effort. Um, we also are working on regulatory acceptance through a series of white papers. We have a technology expo to showcase commercially available technologies, um, and then we also work on education. Um, as I've said, this is the first of a series of NPS webinars and workshops. Um, the webinars are designed to be institutionally agnostic, so not focused on just um, a commercially available system, but about a topic as a whole, um, and they're really for general education. We will follow each webinar with a workshop um, that will be presented by our member companies um, and focused on specifically commercially available MPS systems. Um, so we'll be looking at hosting the workshop related to liver MPS um, early next year, likely in February, um, but we'll, we're still looking at those dates. So I know um, we want to hear quick briefly um, from the IQ. Thanks, Megan. Uh, 
hello people uh, from different different parts of the different spots of the world. Welcome. Um, glad you could join us uh, and, a, and a warm welcome on behalf of IQ and MPS affiliate. We would like to thank the NATRCs for kicking off our joint seminar series, and we are excited to hear today's talk from two excellent speakers. Like Megan alluded, uh, stay tuned uh, for the updates on the next webinar in Q1 of 2022. Uh, now, without further ado, go ahead, Megan. Awesome. OK, so. We have two excellent speakers today that we are excited um, to share with you. Um, the first will be Dr. Robert Fontana from University of Michigan, um, who will be speaking about developments in drug-induced liver injury. And the second will be Dr. Linda Griffith, who will be speaking on integration of systems biology with organs on a chip to humanize liver models in development. So I am going to stop sharing my slides now so our first um, presenter can um, present his slides while I read his bio. Okay, so Dr. Robert Fontana is a clinical investigator with research interests in drug-induced liver injury, viral hepatitis, and acute liver failure. Dr. Fontana has been a member of the NIH Hepatitis B Research Network for the past 10 years and is currently the co-chair of the AASLD COVID-19 Global Outreach and Education Force. He has also been a principal investigator and co-chair of the Drug-Induced Liver Injury Network since 20, 2003. He has helped lead efforts to carefully phenotype patients with DILI and better define the clinical, genetic, and immunological factors associated with DILI susceptibility and outcomes. Dr. Fontana is also the past chair of the AASLD Hepatoc Hepatotoxicity Special Interest Group and was a steering committee member on the CIOMS DILI Report Working Group. He is currently involved in several projects attempting to develop improved causality assessment methods and definitions to guide DILI and HDS research. And with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Fontana. Oh, great. Well, thanks, Megan. Um, it's nice to meet everyone uh, virtually here. Eventually, we'll be back um in, in person so um thanks for the opportunity to to kick this off sounds like an exciting series of webinars you'll be having um hopefully my screen is showing okay and audio is working so without yes, further ado, looks great okay i'll go ahead and get started so just from a perspective of disclosures i do clinical research as megan mentioned with various uh, companies in the liver arena space, and I'm also involved with several NIH networks, uh, as I listed here, and um, coming to you from Ann Arbor, Michigan. So let me just first start off with sort of like leveling the playing field on what we're talking about, because I know there's a lot of individuals who do drug development on the call. <clears throat> and, um, you know, there's really three types of drug-induced liver injury. Um, there's direct hepatotoxins, which aren't very commonly um, used in clinical medicine or get through the regulatory loopholes because of their direct toxicity. And um, these will cause uh, liver injury in humans in a predictable dose-dependent manner, usually relatively rapid, uh, characterized by high AST and ALT levels. You'll get necrosis on a biopsy. And sort of the classic drug that does this is acetaminophen. We know it's a you know universal dose-dependent hepatotoxin, and another drug that's available is niacin. And the reason that these are still on the market is because they were you know uh, been available for over 50 years and um, have a therapeutic niche. But I don't think the you know the next derivative of acetaminophen would likely make it as an analgesic in the current regulatory environment. But what we're most, I think, all interested in is the uh, sort of unpredictable or idiosyncratic drug-induced liver injury, which is rare as opposed to common. It's usually not dose-related. It's usually not predictable, hence that's why we call it idiosyncratic. It can have a variable latency, which makes it difficult to detect. Um, the phenotype of injury can be highly variable as well. And sort of a, an example of this is amoxicillin clavulanate and INH, which you may be familiar with. 
And then there's a third group, which is really a subgroup of idiosyncratic, which is where it's an indirect general mechanism of liver injury. And these are also relatively uncommon. They're not dose related. They may be partially predictable. Um, they also have a delay in onset from starting the drug. And uh, here the, the mechanism is, is felt to be, you know, the um, host immune system impacting either the metabolism of the liver or expression of um, genes in the liver. And so the, the, the sort of the best example I can give you of this is this new class of drugs, which you all are familiar with, checkpoint inhibitors used in oncology, which can lead to a series of immune-mediated adverse events and liver being one of them. Uh, another drug that we think of as an indirect hepatotoxin is rituxin, which can reactivate hepatitis B in, in individuals who are core positive. So, but for purposes of today, I'm really going to focus the energy here on idiosyncratic. So why idiosyncratic DILI? It's the most common reason why uh, there's regulatory actions taken uh, on uh, pharmaceutical agents. Um, in drug development, it's a leading cause as to why uh, drugs don't make it through uh, phase three to the market or that the regulatory agencies either have to limit or lead to withdrawal of agents um, or, you know, restrictions. So this is a, a big problem in drug development. From a clinician's perspective, it's also a significant cause of morbidity and mortality. It's the second leading cause of acute liver failure in the United States behind acetaminophen overdose. And fundamentally, what we all struggle with is there is really no reliable means to predict and or prevent this. So as more and more uh, individuals are treated with more and more drugs, we continue to encounter this in clinical practice and it's a big problem. Now, how common is it? Well, when you, when you again, talk about idiosyncratic DILI now at a population level, it's important, but it's infrequent. So from a, if you look at it from a physician's perspective of all the patients that you see with acute liver injury, say, in the hospital or in your clinic, it's less than 1%. I mean, we're gonna see viral hepatitis, alcohol, fatty liver, and so on. When you look at it from a pharmaceutical uh, developer's perspective, it's also relatively rare. Uh, one in 10,000 to perhaps one in a million prescriptions. Um, and then when you take all the drugs that are out there, and currently in the US, as you know, there's over a thousand medications approved by the FDA, how common is it in the general population? We don't have precise data in the United States, but this is a very nice population-based study from Iceland, where they have a limited population and they have a nationalized health system and EMR. And this is a study that was published a couple of years ago in Gastro. And they prospectively looked at the incidence of DILI in the whole population of the country. And what they found was um, the overall incidence was about 10 to 20 cases per 100,000 people per year. And that it was age related here. You can see here in the blue diamonds that the older you were, uh, the more likely you were to have DILI. However, this could just be an epiphenomenon of drug exposure in that the older we all get, the more likely we are to need medications. So it really is an older liver more susceptible to um, idiosyncratic DILI. There's really not clear cut data that that's the case but we clinically see it more in older people because of greater uh, medication use. So if you take this data and you try to extrapolate it to a large country like the United States, the, the data would suggest perhaps 60 to 100,000 idiosyncratic DILI cases per year in the country. Now, how do we make a diagnosis? This is the most difficult and challenging part of this area because you really have to have an index of suspicion that the drug may have caused the liver injury. So what are some of the clinical features? You look for a reasonable temporal association between when you started the drug and when the liver injury started, and that's generally less than six months. And then you also look to see what happens when you stop the drug, uh, but that requires you to follow the patient over time. You can then, um, after you have a sense of what the latency is, you can see what the lab profile is, and see if it's a drug that's widely available or been around for a while, how does that compare to what's known about it? But the complexity here uh, in Western countries is that patients are oftentimes on multiple medications at the same time. So how do you know if it's an individual drug 
versus several drugs that the patient's taking at the same time. So frequently the patients who are sicker end up with a liver biopsy and there can be clues as to what the specific agent is or if it's some other cause of liver injury that you can detect on a biopsy. Clinically, um, you need to make sure and in parallel to suspecting the drug or holding the drug, look for other much more common causes like viral hepatitis, pancreatic or biliary disease, particularly in older individuals, and then based upon the clinical circumstance, whether ischemia, alcohol, or autoimmune may be in the mix. But fundamentally, it's a clinical diagnosis right now, and we do not have an objective or confirmatory lab test, hence the reason for this clinical seminar. Now, in addition to the different mechanisms and different drugs, there's different severity of DILI. So there can be mild liver injury, which is low level transaminase elevations, for example, less than three times upper limit of normal. And oftentimes when you have a drug this, that does this frequently, uh, many patients will develop tolerance over time. And the perfect example I can give to you of this is isoniazid, where we know that 10 to 20% of otherwise healthy people who get INH for a latent TB will get mild transaminases, but even when you continue the drug, they can go away. So there may be some adaptive mechanisms happening here, either in the liver or in the immune system, allowing continued exposure to the drug. However, with INH, we know that about one in 500 to one in 1,000 will go on to progressive hepatitis with jaundice and end up in the emergency room. And then the dreaded complication in those patients will be the subgroup will go on to acute liver failure characterized by coagulopathy and an encephalopathy. And once you get to this clinical entity, the stakes are high. Um, you may end up needing a liver transplant or die from this idiosyncratic reaction. And so because this is a spectrum and few patients who get to acute liver failure, for example, who start off with mild liver injury, is there different mechanisms that uh, play here that increase susceptibility? So for example, is there impaired regenerative or adaptive responses in the patients who develop progressive hepatitis and liver failure? Or is there an overly exuberant or aberrant host immune response that, le that leads to this rare clinical phenotype. So in this context, um, I got involved in this study called the Drug-Induced Liver Injury Network. It's funded by the NIH since 2004. We have a variety of clinical centers here. You can see here the black um, circles are the current clinical sites uh, enrolling patients. The green ones were previously involved. And then we have a data coordinating center at Duke University. We have a genetics core at Duke, an HLA core at uh, Vanderbilt, and a chemical core in Mississippi. So we have a, a group of uh, academic investigators working with the NIH to study drug-induced liver injury throughout the United States. And what are we doing? So we have this prospective study where we're collecting all comers from any agent, and they can be children down to the age of two through um, adulthood. And patients take whatever medication and develop liver injury that meets certain laboratory threshold of an ALT of at least five times upper limit of normal, ALKFOS two times upper limit of normal, or bilirubin of at least two. And we then identify them. We make sure it's not all the other causes that I mentioned to you, we enroll them, we collect blood for DNA and plasma, serum, and urine, we get uh, liver biopsy tissue if that was obtained clinically, and we follow them out for six months. And the reason we follow them out for six months prospectively is we have to make sure that it wasn't an occult malignancy or some other atypical liver disease that looked just like Dilly. So we follow everyone out for six months, um, and then after their baseline visit, if they have no more liver injury at six months later, we stop following them and they've resolved. However, if they have ongoing liver injury six months after Dilly onset, we then follow them out for four years and we have a long-term natural history study. So this is a cut of the data from 2015 in the first 900 high causality cases. So after we've prospectively followed the patients. We've gotten all the other labs to exclude the competing causes of liver injury, vetted the case with a group of experts. 
we then um, come to what is the causal agent. And what we find is about two thirds of the cases are actually due to a single prescription drug. Um, about 16% of the cases, and this is actually increasing over time, are due to herbal and dietary supplements. And then a multitude of drugs is implicated in 22% of the cases. Now, what is the leading causes of idiosyncratic dilly in our network? Uh, interestingly, this slide shows you that it's almost all antibiotics. Um, amoxicillin clavulanate is the most common overall agent. It was about 12% of the cases. Um, that's not entirely surprising because this is one of the most commonly used uh, prescription antibiotics in all of children and adults in the United States. But what we see that's overrepresented is INH. There's only about 100 to 200,000 people per year getting this drug as opposed to many millions who get amoxicillin clavulanate. So clearly we know INH is intrinsically more hepatotoxic. Also nitrofrantoin only given to probably about half a million people on an annual basis. Bactrim you may know is widely used. It's the fourth most common and so on. Here we have an old NSAID diclofenac showing up, but the rest are all antibiotics. Now, I'm not going to show you all the data. We've learned quite a bit uh, through this natural history study we've been conducting for 15 years, but the bottom line is about 10% of people will die or get a liver transplant who develop DILI um, within six months. And the predictors of who's going to do poorly is the worse your labs are at presentation, no surprise, the more likely you are to have a fatal outcome. Or if you have pre-existing liver disease, which is a growing problem in the U.S., as you know, with the um, epidemic of diabetes, in particular non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. We also have learned, as have other networks around the world, that about 20% of people still have ongoing liver injury six months after they first presented. In our cohort, those who had cholestatic injury and African Americans were more prone to have this. And why they have ongoing liver injury and what happens to them Again, we're in the uh, process of studying that. Now, our real reason um, to initiate this network was to really come to the mechanism so that we can predict and or prevent this entity from happening. So because of this, we've been looking at multiple uh, components of the disease process, which may influence why a particular patient gets idiosyncratic dilly. So we know quite a bit already as um, uh, about the drug, what its chemical structure is, the molecular weight, lipophilicity, the dose duration, and that's actually known in all clinical trials. And that's not enough to explain these rare events. So what we really have expertise in and unique opportunity is to really study the host, the host who gets DILI in great depth and phenotype them in terms of their medical history, their genetics, their immune status, their ability to metabolize xenobiotics. And then we're also starting to touch on the environment that the patient is in, whether it's the microbiome and other dietary factors that may or may not influence susceptibility. So our sort of generic hypothesis here of this adverse drug reaction is you take the medication and uh, it may be uh, metabolized or simply excreted through the urine or bile uh, unchanged. But as we know, most drugs do undergo bioactivation, oftentimes in the liver or the kidney. But uh, through that bioactivation, that helps make it more soluble and excretable. However, in the uniquely susceptible individual, there may be either excessive bioactivation to react metabolite or a drug protein complex that through a variety of intracellular mechanisms that may involve oxidative stress, mitochondrial damage, ER stress, or inhibition of biliary transporters can lead to hepatocyte damage in a susceptible individual. And this may be then mediated either through immune-mediated mechanisms or non-immune-mediated mechanisms. And perhaps the patients who get the low-level transaminase elevations have uh, adaptive mechanisms to pull them out of progressive liver injury or other um, uh, changes that occur within the liver that leads to tolerance to the drug, for example, with some of the chemotherapy agents. Now, you may hypothesize, if this is your generic hypothesis, what might drive unique susceptibility to a rare event? And you could 
hypothesized that polymorphisms in ADME genes, such as P450s or transplanters, might play a role. Or maybe we actually should be looking at the immune system, which we know is highly variable amongst individuals. So polymorphisms are certainly something that came to mind as we started the network 15 years ago. So with that in mind, <clears throat> we've been collecting DNA on everyone the whole time. We have over 2,000 cases now, and we have you know, large population controls um, to, to draw from to compare. And so uh, this isn't all our work, but this is all published genetic associations with DILI susceptibility to individual agents. And what you see here is with a relatively limited number of cases and a variable number of controls that we're finding that um, polymorphisms in the HLA class two and class one alleles appear to be unique susceptibility factors for idiosyncratic DILI in humans. And the odds ratios here you can see vary by agent and the allele frequency of these HLA alleles is also not rare. So although the um, actual episode may be rare, one in a thousand, one in 10,000, the alleles that uh, increase your susceptibility are actually not that rare. So uh, we've done further genetic analyses as the database has grown. And we now, as I said, have over 2000 cases. And in a paper that we published two years ago, we had um, a 1,800 Caucasians, uh, 133 African Americans, and 109 Hispanics. We had a large UK uh, uh, data bank of controls. And what we found here was we did find one genetic locus that was um, a susceptibility factor across ethnicities and across all drugs. And this is in the locus of PTPN22. And this gene has already been implicated in multiple autoimmune disorders, it's on chromosome 22. The overall odds ratio was not very high, it was 1.4, but the fact that it occurred across all ethnicities and all drugs makes us think that this is probably a pan um, uh, risk factor for all idiosyncratic DILI in humans, and it was the first non-MHC SNP to be associated. And as we're now building off of this discovery, we're incorporating the PTPN22 discovery with HLA data that's been around for a while. And in a recent paper, we showed that actually, that there's probably a polygenic risk as we're learning other complex traits are not single gene mediated. And so for example, with augmentin, which I mentioned is the most common cause of idiosyncratic DILI in the United States, a combination of genetic polymorphisms demonstrates an increased risk for a given individual patient. Now, how does this work? Well, a simple uh, cartoon here would be that in an um, HLA susceptible individual, when they're exposed to the drug or the drug metabolite or the drug protein metabolite complex in an antigen presenting cell in an MHC susceptible individual, that this can then activate T cells and the T cells then proliferate and can mediate the liver damage. And there's actually very good human data to show that there are T cell clones that are unique to the drug in individuals who uh, have suffered from idiosyncratic DILI. So it's all about biomarkers, which is what this seminar and webinar is about. So there's a lot of work. I don't have time to go over all this. There's work on detecting DILI at an earlier stage before the ALT, the ALK phosphor, the bilirubin goes up. And the, the clinical trials are the perfect um, experimental model to, to use this. So I encourage all of you doing clinical trials to collect blood for plasma and serum for validation of these biomarkers, GLDH, MIR-122, which is a liver specific microRNA show promise. Um, but really to, to, to come up with the better biomarker, you've got to have an adequate number of cases. Um, you've got to have an RCT, which again, a clinical trial is perfect, drug treated controls and healthy controls. Um, but you could also try to develop biomarkers from individuals who develop clinically apparent liver injury. And this has been work that's been going on for quite some time where you take lymphocytes from the individual patient who developed liver injury, and then you then expose them to the drug in uh, liver microsomes and see if you can come up with a 
uh, uh, in vitro test system. This has been proposed by several groups, particularly in Japan. We actually did this early on in Dillon. We collected uh, PBMCs. We knew what the suspect drug was, and we tried to recapitulate this using a little bit more advanced um, multiplex cytokine um, assay. And we really couldn't reproduce what had been published in the literature. Only two of our 24 cases where we able to get any kind of lymphocyte proliferation. And interestingly, they were both INH. So I'm not sure that simply looking at lymphocytes from the peripheral blood is going to be good enough to come up with a DILI-specific diagnostic test. So um, you all know very well that there's a big disconnect between preclinical models in human adverse events, particularly liver injury, and that preclinical animal models really do not predict human dilly at all. This is a talk in and of itself, but um, there's just there's a disconnect across species. And knowing that the government has gotten involved and uh, indicated they really want to reduce animal research and come up with alternative methods and move more towards human uh, systems. So what kind of human systems are out there? Well, you know, human hepatocytes um, are an excellent choice, but they're very difficult to get, uh, usually from um, surgeries done for some benign liver tumor. Um, there's a limited supply. The quality of them is variable, and their half-life to do experiments is very limited um, in the lab. Um, so therefore, you could go to a more reliable, um, reproducible source like immortalized uh, cell lines like HEP RG2 and HEP G2 cells. But here now you lose some of the uh, mature uh, phenotype expression in these cell lines. So really what would be ideal would be to get cells from individual patients who may have gotten DILI or were exposed to the drug and didn't get DILI. Um, uh, have a supply from those individual patients and recapitulate human physiology in vitro. So how might you do this? This is a nice review article on hepatology. Again, I don't have time to go through all the research in this and Dr. Griffiths, I'm sure we'll cover this in more detail, but um, you could just take simple hepatocytes, um, as I mentioned, human hepatocytes and do uh, various things in a 2D culture system you get better expression and more mature cells that um, will synthesize albumin and have higher levels of P450 expression. We know when you do co-culture, for example, with endothelial cells, stellate cells, or cholangiocytes, um, or you can put them in extracellular matrices that are bioengineered to um, enhance cell-to-cell uh, -cell contact and differentiation. Um, alternatively, you could go to 3D culture systems, which are probably more physiologic, where the cells can actually aggregate in a 3D system. And as you know, there are spheroids uh, models and lots of work with spheroids. And then even further along is organoids, where you get uh, hepatocytes, cholangiocytes, and even um, endothelial cells in a mini liver organoid. Um, and then from the organoids, you could even then take them and put them onto a chip. And from the chip, you can even get further uh, mini human livers. And uh, we're gonna hear a little bit more about the emulate chip system where you can load, for example, hepatocytes on, in one part of the cartridge and endothelial cells in the other and get an in vitro human liver physiologic test system that can uh, allow you to do experiments up to 28 days and allow you to change drug concentrations and effluents and, um, do all kinds of nice physiologic experiments. And this whole system has been developed, as we'll hear about, and is commercially available. So uh, here at Michigan with my collaborator, uh, Johnny Sexton, who's on the call, uh, we've developed this into um, a test system for human liver hepatotoxicity from drugs. And very briefly, the concept here is taking induced pluripotent stem cells from uh, patients who've uh, developed liver injury, uh, getting them differentiated into foregut spheroids from spheroids with various hepatocyte growth factors, getting them then to a human liver organoid, which con uh, consists of hepatocytes, stellate cells, and Cooper cells, all from the same source. And then from this, you can do experiments with the human liver organoids themselves 
in a 384 well-based assay, for example, exposing them to variable concentration of the drug or combinations of drugs, or you can load these organoids onto this human liver chip system to get even further differentiation and then do a, a series of omics-based um, uh, experiments to learn about how you can recapitulate human liver physiology. So this is a platform we're developing here. Again, we have the ability to go back and um, get iPSC cells from 2,000 well-characterized patients who we've already done GWAS and HLA. We know what their uh, suspect drug is, and we're in the process now of developing uh, iPSC cells from some of these to develop a biobank and then use them in this liver organoid uh, system. And just very briefly to show you that we are uh, being successful with this model, um, you may be aware of this drug development program from Springbank Pharmaceuticals. There's a lot of drug development in HPV space right now. And the question is, can you improve upon what we already have, which is nucleoside and nucleotide analogs to lead to S antigen clearance? So this was a phase two study of tenofovir plus inarigavir. It's an investigational anti-HPV drug. And uh, uh, tenofovir has been around for quite a bit, very safe and liver friendly. Inarigavir is a new clinical uh, chemical entity. And um, in the phase two trial, unfortunately, they had to halt the whole drug development program because they encountered seven out of 42 patients who developed clinically significant liver injury with ALT elevations, a uh, couple got hospitalized, and one unfortunately developed fulminant liver failure and actually died at 16 weeks, and this drug development program had to be stopped. And when they went back and they looked at the, um, obviously, animal toxicology in the human hepatocyte and hep RG2 cells, they couldn't find any reason why this combination would be a problem. So this was a curious test case for us, so in our human liver organoid system on the um, uh, 384 well plate, we can test various uh, concentrations of tenofovir, tenofovir alflunamide, and inarigavir alone. And you can see that ALT release is very minimal here after seven days in um, culture. However, when you add uh, tenofovir alflunamide plus inarigavir or tenofovir alone plus inarigavir, you get synergistic hepatotoxicity here with ALT elevations in a concentration um, dependent manner. And then when you uh, do a similar experiment in our um, liver chip system, you can see here that tenofovir alone, this is basal expression, this is TAP alone, this is inarigavir. There's really no uh, cell cytoskeletal change through the cell mask or lipid tox in the green stain here. But when you put the two together, lo and behold, you get synergistic hepatotoxicity in our microphysiologic liver uh, system, indicating that probably the mechanism of injury here is lipid accumulation, which makes us think that there's inadvertent mitochondrial toxicity, which had not been uh, anticipated with all the in vitro test system um, that was done prior to the phase two study. So very interesting retrospectively that perhaps if we had had this knowledge and data uh, before, would have been more informed for the um, development of this drug. So with that, let me uh, stop and thank all of my uh, co-investigators in Dillon. This is a multi-center ongoing study with individuals from the NIH and um, other clinical centers. And here at Michigan, uh, my own research group where we're working closely with Johnny and his lab to develop this in vitro diagnostic. So let me stop there and I will stop sh share, uh, sharing my screen and hopefully be able to turn this over now to Linda. Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Fontana. Um, Linda, if you wanna go ahead and unmute and share your slides, and then if Dr. Fontana, you want to mute and turn off your video, um, that would be great. So as Linda's sharing her slides, I will give a brief um, a brief introduction to her. 
Um, so Dr. Linda Griffith is the School of Engineering Teaching Innovation Professor of Biological and Mechanical Engineering and Mac Vicker Fellow at MIT, where she directs the Center for Gynepathology Research. Dr. Griffith has pioneered approaches in tissue engineering, including the first tissue engineered cartilage in the shape of a human ear, commercialization of the 3D printing process for manufacture of FDA approved scaffolds, commercialization of the 3D perfused liver chip for direct development, and synthetic matrices for tissue morphogenesis. She recently led one of two major DARPA-supported body-on-a-chip programs, resulting in the first platform to culture 10 different human mini-organ systems interacting continuously for a month. She has over 200 peer-reviewed publications and holds more than a dozen patents. She holds numerous impressive memberships, including in the National Academy of Engineering, and she recently was elected to the National Academy of Medicine. Um, today, she will be presenting on um, humanizing in vitro liver models for toxicity. Uh, and that, I will turn it over to Linda. Thank you. So it's wonderful to be here today. Um, I have not been going to as many liver meetings lately for reasons, certainly not for toxicology for reasons I'll describe, but the invitation made me think a lot about the intersection of things we're doing now with the toxic liver toxicology community. So I hope today what I'm going to present are ideas and to have a discussion about pain points in developing better models. And I loved Bob's talk, that's tremendous work. I'm not going to talk about any IPS derived liver models. I think it's fantastic to see the success these models are having. And I'm very, very impressed with what Bob just showed in the antibiotic, in the um, uh, Dealey model at the end of his talk. That That's really terrific work. So. Today's presentation for me is meant to present some of the things mainly that we're trying to push in terms of technologies, but integration with framing the right questions. And I think the preceding talk was amazing to help orient us to the right kinds of questions and set up a discussion about what the real pain points are so that I can work on things that are most useful rather than continuing down paths that may be obsolete in the near future due to other things that you know about. Um, so I'm gonna start with a slide that's gonna be out of left field a little bit because my main lab focus right now is actually in gynecology. I run a center for gynepathology research at MIT. I have NIH grants in this area, and we focus on really trying to do better diagnostic and therapeutics for endometriosis and adenomyosis in particular, but many other menstrual disorders. And we have had, I'm not going to give you all our publications, of which there's now a lot, but the thing that we brought to the field, the perspective, is to get people away from thinking of these diseases, which afflict about 10% of all women, as a, a disease. We brought the concept that they are not one disease. There's likely different mechanistic bases, even though there are not bona fide somatic mutations, there are epigenetic changes, gene environment interactions across multiple multiple SNPs that likely are leading to propensity to develop this disease. And so we have, I actually go in the operating room and collect samples from patients actually all over the world and have published a number of clinical papers. But all of our work in MPS right now is driven by wanting to develop non-hormonal therapies for this disease that will benefit more patients. So I just want to do, that's my official sort of disclosure because I'm not working specifically with any drug companies uh, right now. Um, we in particular identified June kinase as a major regulator of inflammation and invasion, but it was in a subset of patients. And I'm going to come back to that because that's really been a theme in everything, including our liver work lately. Okay, so it's a potential target. Um, there was a clinical trial, Merck, um, driven by Steve Palmer, who was at Merck KGA at that time. Um, Preclinical models showed it was effective. Um, the clinical study that Preglam did was unsuccessful, possibly, but it was definitely related to study design, but there also were a number of other factors um, influencing this. And so Palmer remains interested in this. He's gone into um, academia. There were also some daily concerns, as probably many of you know, with any of the June kinase inhibitors uh, due to their effects on uh, uh, the liver. Um, and from the, uh, the gynecology perspective, this is just an example that underscores what Bob just talked about. Um, 
your crystal. As acetate is a great drug for patients with fibroids who have heavy menstrual bleeding, except for the Dealey. It got uh, approved in 2012 in, in Europe. Um, Dealey cases that were very serious requiring transplant led to suspension. It's back because it's so clinically useful, but with a lot of restrictions. And there are some possible um, structural factors with the, uh, the entity that make it susceptible to Dealey. And this is not a, an area of my expertise. What I know is patients really suffered when this drug went off the market. So I retain a very strong interest in how drugs interact with liver because I'm very committed to getting a new drug on the market. So I was asked to talk a little about the history and I will, and, and then some current things. And so I'll do this briefly. I got involved in liver tissue engineering in the 80s actually through a um, postdoc with a liver transplant surgeon. When I became a faculty member, I soon realized um, that we really needed better models of liver disease and liver injury to help patients not need a liver transplant. So in the 90s, I shifted a huge part of my lab toward building in vitro models of liver. And our first um, microreactor liver chip is shown here, and it is useful for illustrating the design principles. The first one was actually made out of silicon chip that had uh, through holes. And um, these little holes, the dimensions of them, allow freshly isolated or um, cryopreserved cells to attach to the walls of these holes and form little 3D tissue-like structures. And I'm showing here some data from um, the extensive work we first did in rats showing you could get things like fenestrated endothelium in these in vitro models driven by a combination of geometry, fluid factors, and so on, biochemical and biophysical factors that would drive liver-like tissue. This isn't liver, but it has many of the functions of liver retained over very long periods of time in culture. So we can now, in traditional culture, Bob was right, you can't use them for more than a couple of days, but certainly in many of the 3D culture models, weeks and weeks of culture of primary cells now from humans are possible. The innovation we had here was to have multiple of these little channels, um, and there's a filter here. So when you initially seed the cells, they can be driven to form, you flow fluid this way initially, then when they form a tissue attached to the walls, you reverse the flow, and you have a scalable little uh, system where this distance is governed by oxygen transport limitations and there are oxygen tension drops across the tissue. Okay, so we published a lot of initial papers characterizing this for a number of applications and got a lot of interest in academia and in industry because the whole field was starting to eye the use of these kinds of in vitro models for better drug development. So this is going back all the way into the early 2000s. But we focused in our collaborations, many collaborations with industry on fit for purpose assays because this is not liver. So I um, love that today's uh, discussions are around that. Because there was so much interest in this, we adapted the design to a multi-well plate format in collaboration with Dave Trumper, a mechanical engineer at MIT, built these really useful, very robust and very versatile microfluidic pumps driven by pneumatics that can circulate fluid through the scaffold. So this is a very old version, but it's illustrative that cells are seated here. This is when we still were using silicon chips and you just pump the fluid around in either direction. And now see and buy, so then we, uh, had this and CN Bio commercialized it as the liver chip, and they now have a disposable version that is used in a number of pharma companies, including our collaborator, current collaborators, Novo Nordisk, um, the Physio Mimics. And we actually use this in our lab now as well. And it retains the key features of having a scaffold that you simply pipette. Um, everything we do now is human. We purchase cryopreserved hepatocytes, but you can also get non-parenchymal cells commercially from a number of sources. They're not super, super uh, available, but you can get them and we do use them in the lab. So, so that is a very quick tour of the technologies. And this is not liver. It's not what I think will answer everything, certainly for Dealey, but it's, it's, it's a has turned out to be a useful model. This system has, um, a, because there's a 3D structure in this little channel, there is an oxygen tension pressure drop across the tissue. And we published on that 
in both, uh, this is from RAT, but we recently published some human data uh, that I'll mention later. Now, a lot of characterization was done on this for application to PK after we commercialized it with CN Bio and through the DARPA program that I was part of because a focus in that program I'll mention again in a moment was really around doing ADNI tox applications. Um, a huge advantage of the approach that we took compared to what um, uh, Dr. Fontana showed which was the emulate chip is when emulate started they were out of pdms and in fact we were in the same darpa program together and three years in when we were required at the contractor meeting to show our pk they could not get pk on their drug because it was lipophilic and absorbed into the pdms when it was injected into the device now i think they probably fixed that since then but ours was built this way from the beginning to be um, sensitive to the need to do pk and so there's there's a number of publications, many with Murat Chirit, who was a postdoc and scientist with us and then started Javelin Biotech um, out of work in the lab. Now, over the years, I was never, I, I don't think I was ever, ever brought a problem in liver uh, uh, preclinical studies from industry that did not involve some kind of immune system issue. Because there's a lot you can do with primary hepatocytes, actually probably a lot more than you think even for Dealey. Um, and uh, this is just an example. We worked with Amgen for a long time and they were interested in the off-target effects of tocilizumab, which is an anti-IL-6 receptor antibody. It's not their drug, but it's emblematic of the kinds of off-target effects you can get from biologics. And here the challenge was you could not recapitulate the features seen in patients, which is that when they took um, tocilizumab, there was a change in metabolism of other drugs, particularly those metabolized by CYP3A4, such as simvastatin. And so uh, was this due to uh, treatment of the inflammation and inflammation can regulate CYP expression, or was it because hepatocytes express both IL-6 receptors? So we worked with them to develop a model that required weeks of culture of hepatocytes together with Kupfer cells, uh, recapitulating features seen in patients. So this is just an example of the kinds of things you can do even with a simple liver MPS where the advantage is weeks long of culture for primary human multi-cell type cultures. Um, now, in working with Amgen, our, one of our first projects was inspired by Cindy Afshari, whom some of you may know, she's currently at j, &J but she was got us interested in the Dealey problem early on. And in her case, she saw it as a gut liver interaction. So this is going back before the beautiful, beautiful genetics and kinds of studies you saw in the previous talk, but going back 20 years, thinking about the gut as a source of inflammatory components. If you have leaky gut due to any of the things, including the drug itself, um, causing liver inflammation and synergizing with metabolism in the liver to cause a Dealey event. So she wanted to know if we could model that. And so this ability to model multi-organ interactions sparked us um, through a lot of other things, including my interest in gynecology and drug development for gynecology, into becoming one of the teams, two teams funded by DARPA um, with the challenge of building a 10 organ platform. And I'm um, just showing you, this was the proof of principle paper showing that we met our DARPA uh, milestones in creating a 10 organ platform that had 10 different systems coexisting for a month in the seven um, organ version of that. We demonstrated diclofenac PK where we predicted what would happen on the platform um, by, uh, uh, we predicted what would happen on the platform um, by uh, off platform individual MPS experiments. And then we predicted what would happen and in fact showed that we could get that PK. So that was a one-off kind of experiment. And um, there are of course many other um, groups doing interconnected organs, both in academia and in industry. And I'll note particularly Hesperos, um, Mike Schuler and Jay Hickman. It's uh, really great technology. It's the kind of thing when I look at it, I say, I wish I'd done that. I think they, um, have tackled some interesting problems uh, for toxicology in particular, which is uh, not necessarily my, my current focus. But we then turned to doing um, 
thinking about how can we start to look at the gut liver interaction and this is a paper uh, the first study we did and it's not a terrific study because we had a human liver uh, human hepatocytes and kupfer cells but at that time our gut model um, back then was was limited to keiko2 cells and uh HT29s as a, as a gut model. But nevertheless, it was informative because we figured out how to set up a platform so that we could simulate certain features of the, um, the connections that the liver has to the arterial blood flow and then the portal blood flow with the mixing chamber and ask questions about how gut liver interactions might influence metabolism, but especially inflammation. And so again, this is just a very simple model where we use diclofenac and diclofenac plus LPS. At, uh, sorry, we, we had a, a very simple model where we, again, um, uh, KCO2s uh, on a transwell. And um, so either alone or connected to a liver uh, continuously, because we have these microfluidic pumps that allow us to control very high exchange rates between different organ systems. We, we set it up with immune cells on the bottom. So these are innate immune cells and they would reach their um, appendices up through the, the layer. So we looked at the control versus just the drug versus just LPS plus diclofenac plus LPS in the system. So this didn't have bacteria, LPS. And LPS was used at a very gentle, mild, um, endotoxemia, it was not like you're screaming high levels of LPS. Um, and I won't go through all that paper. Again, it was cell lines, so not necessarily the most um, representative of human, but, but a good first start to show things. For example, that when we connected gut and liver together, the metabolism of diclofenac was affected by this, and this has all been published. But importantly, when we added LPS, there was a hugely synergistic amplification of certain kinds of inflammatory signaling compared to when we added LPS to either of the systems alone. And so this got us really, really thinking about the system's immunology and how we do scaling in these in vitro models, particularly when we're considering inflammation, we're considering uh, multi organ interactions. And I'm not going to be able to go into a lot of the math on this, except to say it's a huge area of focus right now is to start understanding how we measure and interpret inflammation and um, interactions between inflammation and drug metabolism and uh, so on in these systems, in particular, how the cell types that we choose to put into our systems are influencing the system response when it's an immune-mediated response. So we've gone on to use this multi-organ platform, especially as we developed it further, focusing on smaller organs, not the 10 one, but up to three, and we have a three-organ system um, that's on uh, a platform. And we published uh, a number of things with this, and I'll highlight just some uh, big picture from work that a fabulous postdoc, Martin Trapachar, who's now at Johns Hopkins did, in using a um, three organ platform. Again, this is all of those pneumatic uh, drivers. So this is what it looks like in the incubator. Um, uh, so in, in using that to study some more complex questions that affect liver. In particular, we got funded by DARPA to use this to look at systemic effects of gut-derived short-chain fatty acids, which of course are produced primarily in the colon by a number of microbes, um, that produce at very high levels, butyrate, acetate, and propionate. They diffuse through the um, gut epithelium where they're partly metabolized, but they of course go to the liver, influence liver immunology and metabolism. They've been associated with a number of liver metabolic diseases, but they also, um, in the, particularly acetate, goes to the brain. Uh, these affect brain development, but they especially affect brain inflammation. And so we um, probed certain uh, interactions between gut and liver and gut, liver, and brain and have published these. But I want to give you um, just a little highlight of the gut liver, again, using that same setup I showed you before that was in our pilot study. But instead, now we are going to use um, gut cells that are from primary donors. And uh, we had healthy donor and we had a donor with ulcerative colitis. And these are cells maintained on trans wells. 
and standard culture for gut and the trans wells, you can see that these are uh, a little messed up and this is typical of cells from disease patients. On the bottom of the trans wells, we made dendritic cells and macrophages from a, a donor unrelated to either of these. And it's okay uh, to do that with the Nate cells, but we also then would add um, uh, adaptive immune cells to the circulation. And because Th17 and Tregs are really involved in um, some of these liver uh, inflammatory diseases mediated by short chain fatty acids, we focused on them. Um, this isn't a comprehensive innate immune cell study. It was again, a proof of principle, start thinking, how do we bring innate immune cells in? And so in this study, what we did is this kind of setup, plus or minus short chain fatty acids in the gut apical side. And so we characterized the PK of how the short chain fatty acids entered the system, their distribution to the liver, and and especially measured the immunolo immunological effects. And I, again, I'm not going to go into all the, that data because today is really to generate some uh, just familiarity with the kinds of things we're doing. And then I can come back and have in-depth discussions with anyone who would like more information. What we found really surprised us because we found that the short chain fatty acids, which are typically viewed as being salubrious, for inflammation were in fact really good if the patient cells were, were, the gut cells were from a healthy patient. But if the cells came from the ulcerative colitis donor, in fact, the short chain fatty acid exacerbated inflammation. And so there's a lot we can learn about the interaction of the endogenous health state of the patient vis-a-vis -vis, um, their uh, Im immune uh, drug, you know, potentially drug, this didn't have a specific drug, but I think you can see where we're going, that we're trying to build the kind of more sophisticated models that would let you probe these things um, in very well-defined uh, ways. Um, and again, this has all been published. Um, but I wanna come back to an older, uh, pose the question of the inflammation again, um, and I, I think, again, uh, Dr. Fontana's talk alluded to this. I think that what they're doing is really exciting, and I look forward to seeing more data. But when we even first started thinking of Dealey, um, such a complex problem, and any kind of in vitro MPS is complex, uh, expensive. You have to have specialized knowledge how to operate them. And in collaboration with Doug Laufenberger, who's a pioneer in systems biology and systems immunology at MIT and a, the founding department head of our Department of Biological Engineering, he really pioneered thinking about the way that cells respond to their environment as a set of cue signal, a cue signal response paradigm. In other words, can we start to just think about information flow in cells as a way to create the simplest models that we need to use in order to get information out. So for example, if a hepatocyte, let's take a hepatocentric model in the liver is impinged on by inflammatory cytokines plus drugs, um, these cues are integrated through signal transduction processes to determine a cell response. And so can we create models, mathematical models of these responses? And so this has been an area of tremendous uh, interest in his lab and in collaboration, um, we came back to this idea of could we build a simpler model of uh, leaky gut and idiosyncratic toxicity, again, using this information flow. So in the model, we asked, could we just use hepatocytes and use instead of, you know, complex immune cells, could we mimic inflammation with adding cytokines, a mixtures of cytokines that would be characteristic of what would happen due to leaky gut. That's a much simpler model than building a whole liver with those. So what we did um, in this is we used rat cells, hep 2 and primary human hepatocytes. And this was with um, Jim Shu when he was at Pfizer and when Pfizer had an RTC uh, in Cambridge. And so the experiment was this, we had um, multi-well plates in which we had the cells plated in your standard cell culture format. So they only lasted a few days. We would give cytokines and drugs. So this is a high throughput experiment, dose response for the drugs. 
And then, so these are the cues. We measured um, numerous signal transduction pathways and so toxicity assays, either uh, lethal responses or through imaging that Jim Shu did, sublethal responses. So it's a high throughput cue signal response, and this has been, all been published. But the crux of it here, it was really interesting, even hep G2, much more so than the rat, not surprisingly, could capture almost all of the Dealey drugs. He, Jim put, put together a list of 90 Dealey drugs. And the crux is here. So here's a dose response um, uh, in the absence of, um, this is a dose response. And, and then this is what happens if you just add the cytokines, you get a little cell death. And this is what you would predict if you just added the cytokine death to the uh, drug death. But in fact, when you do the experiment, you see this synergy because the cells are dying at a much lower drug concentration than they would be. Uh, in the absence of the inflammation. So there's a synergistic effect of the drug plus information, inflammation on death. And what we found by doing a large scale screen, and this is from the primary hepatocyte cultures, again, using 90 drugs, um, is that all of the idiosyncratic drugs um, that are shown in red were captured by the assays that we did. And none of the non-hepatotoxic drugs, with the exception of clithromycin, which is sort of a borderline, came through as positive on this assay. And I'm showing you this, even though it's a fairly old study, because if you think about the experiments in a certain way, you can certainly get information that you might think you need to use a much more complex experimental condition for. And also to give you an idea that we're not all about just trying to get people to adopt MPS technologies, our uh, focus is trying to think about how do we conceptualize the biology going on and build technologies that address the actual pain points versus um, the, uh, the imagined ones that engineers in my lab might have. So what about the liver compromised populations, people who are taking multiple drugs, older, fatty liver disease, et cetera, we may need to go back to the MPS for them. And in that regard, we're working with Novo Nordis to develop liver metabolic um, disease models. This is just showing some unpublished data captured with uh, Jakob Jeppesen and on um, type two diabetes. And the one thing I will point out that our in vitro model does that's hard to do in some of the spheroid based models and other models is we're able to measure the clearance of insulin because of the cell medium ratios we have. So we can induce a um, insulin resistance phenotype by many metrics by simply um, it elevating insulin to a level that's uh, approximately the portal concentration in a type two diabetic compared to a physiological concentration. And we're going on to do a number of things. Um, and I, again, just wanna give you an idea of things we're trying to develop. Some of them will translate into more commercial space or more readily available space. One thing is um, thinking about the uh, difference between a high throughput, small number of cells animal models where you get more information because of the greater diversity and phenomena you have. And can we do things at the meso scale in vitro? And we just published a paper in biofabrication describing this. And it's really just uh, to generate thought for what you might do. We use an approach called uh, projection microstereolithography, oops, I forgot this was animated, which is a very high resolution um, solid preform fabrication process developed by our collaborator, Nick Fang at MIT. And you can just see some of the kinds of structures that he had published when we started working with him. And we decided if we wanna grow a million liver cells, and there were some reasons to do this, some of the more, um, more complex assays that, are, uh, that you measure on DNA, uh, you, you really do need to uh, have about a million cells. Um, this is for some work we're doing with Rick, Rick Young's lab. So we designed a kind of uh, scaffold that could be put into the liver chip that mimics certain features of the way liver uh, distributes blood, but we don't have blood. So we designed this to control fluid flow in three dimensions through some very high velocity central channels that would let a tiny amount of fluid seep out into a 3D liver structure. So there's one little lobule-like structure, but many of them on the scaffold. And so it was kind of a fun project um, because we could get nice tissue formation, but we could also get a greater level of um, function in this compared even to the liver chip because we're providing a, a little bit more of a 3D uh, liver-like structure, 
by CYP384 activity, for example, you know, on, on a per cell basis compared to liver chip. But importantly, again, thinking of disease modeling, just proof of principle, and again, this is published, um, showing that we could measure insulin clearance and ultimately, again, induce this insulin resistant phenotype. And I'm showing you this because um, uh, a question I think arises, do we need to start capturing these features of liver metabolic diseases when we do in vitro models? I'm not gonna pass judgment on that, that's for you to tell me. Um, I wanna finish with where we're going in device design and it comes back to the endometriosis. We do an enormous amount of tissue engineering in my lab that I didn't talk about today, primarily with epithelial barrier tissues. We have the most sophisticated model for um, epithelial organoid in synthetic matrices. So this is an endometrial organoid from a patient um, growing in a completely synthetic hydrogel. But where we're going is we are building vascularized models of these endometriosis lesions. And, and now this is important for liver, as I'll show you in a moment. But I want to tell you how we're doing it. We're collaborating with Roger Cam, an MIT faculty member who, over the past 20 years, has pioneered microfluidic devices that enable formation of microvascular beds from one microfluidic channel to the other. You seed endothelial cells and fibroblasts into that central channel, and they self-assemble, as you see here, to form these very stable microvascular beds that can be imaged over long periods of time in culture um, because these are microfluidic devices, and you can flow immune cells or tumor cells, et cetera, through these. Um, now, his lab has used um, these devices extensively to study things such as how neutrophils facilitate extravasation of tumor cells through the vessel wall into the extracellular space. So these little red neutrophils are swarming around and they're helping this cell move out into the extracellular space. Of course, once the cell is out there in this microfluidic device, you can keep it going and you can watch the tumor grow. So these are some of the kinds of applications that his lab has um, used microfluidic devices for. So we have been teaming up um, to study endometriosis is what we're funded to study first, and he's commercialized his um, device uh, through AIM. And this is just um, another image from our joint student um, showing that she can recapitulate the formation of the microvessels and putting immune cells flowing through them. Um, but we're applying it to creating uh, microvascularized endometriosis lesions. So this is our, this happens to just be fibroblasts and macrophage. Um, and it's a student, Ellen Kahn. So this is unpublished together with Roger Cam. And so here in that kind of a little modification of that device I just showed, we're starting to build microvascularized little lesions. Now I want to go back and study, uh, you know, so you can see the vessels invading the lesion here. Uh, now I want to go back um, with Roger. Uh, 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 we want to go back and study how drugs we're giving to patients now interact with lesions because a lot of patients are refractory to the drugs. So we've been adapting the um, the technology we developed under DARPA. Uh, of, of these really cool pumps to the microfluidic microvascularized device format. So we've now got a wonderful platform that has four chips that employs the kinds of pumps uh, that we used on the DARPA platform, but now to drive circulation in that kind of microfluidic device I just showed you. And what's really important is these are all made from thermoplastics. They are not PDMS because we've got to be able to control estradiol and progesterone to very, very sticky hormones. And we are now, Roger and I, applying this to create vascularized liver models. So that's why I'm showing this. Um, uh, and in fact, Steve Palmer and I just got new NIH grants and we're gonna work together to test June kinase for efficacy against endometriosis, but he is also coming from the drug industry, very concerned about liver toxicity, so has begged us to make sure that we evaluate any of the new compounds that he and his team come up with for liver toxicity in our new models that employ immunology. And so um, 
I'll summarize by saying there's a lot of great liver models. I think the kinds of things that Bob Montana talked about are really cool and emerging with respect to IPS, and I didn't cover those, so I'm thrilled that he did. The group at Pittsburgh is also doing a lot of great work, as is um, this uh, Cincinnati Hospital group, so I'm watching that with fascination. Um, Maybe we need better underlying models of liver metabolic disease uh, to help with the tox. I think the more sophisticated models are still mostly academic. CN Bio has a gut liver um, available for, for use. Uh, but I think that the systems biology immunology, which I didn't go into the weeds on, but is huge, huge area of focus at MIT, is needed for experiment design and interpretation. And because of this last bit, um, we have been asking at MIT if an industry consortium would help push development of these models faster so that you keep the academics on track with constant input from industry about where we may be doing things great or where we may need to redirect our focus. So we are in the process of setting up a consortium that we're calling Humanizing Drug Development. Sorry, I didn't put the name here. And anybody can email me if they want to learn more about it. There's one for skin that's launching very soon on sub-Q delivery of therapeutics. Um, but there's sort of some core activities that I've hinted at all through the talk with technologies, but also systems biology. And we have one on the gut that is very likely, we have a lot of work actually co-culturing um, anaerobic bacteria with colon uh, mucosal barrier that I didn't talk about here. But I'll mention the liver in particular because that um, working group, which has a number of companies, about 12 companies have participated um, and many are eager to launch a consortium project sometime next year. And we're going to focus on bringing the sinusoidal endothelial cells in this um, in a robust way, because that was identified as a pain point. How do we get co-cultures that can include, and, and you know, maybe this isn't crucial for tox, but it's certainly crucial for a lot of the biologics, as well as um, a lot of the more immunological uh, issues. And so we're bringing in some IPS uh, uh, sources for this particular project, as well as primary human uh, LSCCs. And I'll just uh, mention this because some people may be interested in joining this and you can contact me if you are. I'll end there. Huge amount of uh, collaboration. Dave Trumper on the hardware, Rebecca Carrier on the gut, Doug Laufenberger and others I've mentioned. And um, I think, you know, we're just doing the best we can to model and I'd appreciate any feedback on how we're um, at this point, I would welcome um, any questions putting into the chat box. Um, again, that's at the top of your screen. Um, on the far right, there'll be a red leave button, and to the left, there'll be a little chat box. Um, also, in the time, um, while I'm hopefully waiting for some questions to arise, um, I'm going to put in um, the chat a link to our technology provider hub that the North American 3Rs Collaborative um, has put together, um, which has all of our member organizations sorted by the um, organ type that they offer. I think that might be interest to some of you today, and we also welcome feedback on it. As I wait for just um, hopefully some other questions, um, I am going to launch um, a couple of polls so that we can get some feedback as well. Um, so I believe these will pop up for you on your screen. These are anonymous uh, and we will not share the results with the attendees, so feel free to be honest. So while that poll is going on, Bob, I, I really oh. am impressed with your data from the IPSCs. And maybe you could share what, you know, you think are the, um, you know, what, how far you think you can go with the IPSCs and where mm. you think there's still a lot of barriers. Because that's, you know, more and more stuff is coming out there and it looks just wonderful what you have. Yeah. So I, I think, you know, I, I think our talks are very complimentary. And you know, I think if I step back and I think about, um, you know, what are we trying to model and then the, the work that you're doing and, you know, some of the liver and obviously the endometrial, um, you know, we are kind of interested to get at the mechanism of idiosyncratic dilly. Mm -hmm. And we, we felt that, you know, starting with the patient and working backwards was the best way to go, you know, because that's that's sort of what oh, yeah, we have. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I I do that with um, the endometriosis work. We start with the patient. I mean, I go to all the I go to the clinical meetings all the yeah. time. Yeah. 
and so I, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of the you of endometriosis. So I'm, um, <laughs> okay. I, I'm agreeing with you, and I, and yeah. so I'm, 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 so I, I'm applauding what you yeah, do. Yeah, no, no, so, so I guess I just, I just point that out because, um, you know, we, 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 we may be on the right track, we may not be. So, for example, we have the advantage that these iPSC cells are derived from the patients who had the, you know, the adverse event of interest or the disease of interest or response to drug of interest. Um, however, um, we're still, you know, somewhat removed away from true in vivo circumstances, but we think we're closer. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, certainly I'm very intrigued by your work about, like, as you're, you know, modeling the importance of integrating the immune system into these, you know, these chip um, type of these microphysiologic systems and how to recapitulate um, you know, a human situation as best you can. So, you know, we're thinking that we can start with the liver chip. We can, we think we can get several cell types up and running and mm -hmm. recapitulate, a, you know, a, a zonal distribution of um, hepatocyte differentiation. We need to show that and we probably have to do more work to, to get to that point. But then introducing the immune system through um, PBMCs, we may be a little bit naive um, in terms of how we're doing it. And I liked your idea, first start with just maybe cytokines that you know inflammatory uh, lymphocytes may generate to see if you get a difference in response. Because when you actually bring the cells in, it could be even more complex. So sort of like do it in a stepwise manner. Um, but you know, we don't know that we'll we'll get to it. But we're certainly we were very excited to see that we were able to recapitulate a real life problem with the tenofovir and yeah. that, that really had cool. not been it had been tested in Hep G two cells, human hepatocytes, yeah. and no one saw it coming. And the phenotype we think is pretty similar to what was seen in patients, um, and that made us very excited. But maybe you know, like we're lucky on our first our first go around. So I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you That's both. A good question. Mm -hmm. um, we've been kind of hinting. So maybe I could go first because yeah. we're hinting at the IPS. Yeah. I, I think. Um, so let me read it out loud just in case anyone okay, can't see the can't chat. See it. Yeah. Um, yeah. So question for both. Um, for liver models, a key issue for MPS construction is NPC availability, both animal and human. Where do you see this issue evolving in the next few years? What is a roadmap for better availability? And Linda, if you want to answer first. So I'll answer first because I think temporally, if we look near term, the NPCs are becoming more available. You can get NPCs from LifeNet to a certain extent. You know, you can get stellate cells, Kupfer cells. You can sort of get LSCCs from LifeNet. Uh, Thermo Fisher has Kupfer cells, not a whole lot of vials. So they're there. It's tricky to get them. So I think there's still a supply issue. This is one of the reasons we started, we're trying to start this industry consortium. We want to figure this out. How do we do this short term? How do we do this long term? Um, I, I, you know, it could be that the same kind of forces that drove the greater availability of cryopreserved human hepatocytes will drive more availability of the NPCs. One of the things when you get stellate cells, they're activated because they've been expanded on plastic. We have a huge amount of work in the lab with our other tissues we work with expanding stromal cells in 3D so that they don't become activated. And this is something that we've talked to LifeNet about doing a project on separately. Um, but you know, so we may come up with either hybrid models. We're looking at iPSCs as a source of the LSECs in particular. Um, we, we may come up with hybrid models where we can take like, uh, you know, PBMCs and create Kupfer cells. There's some people who have done that. Hemoshear's done that. Uh, so I think there'll be a number of things that we're, we'll explore from the primary cell space and it's going to get better and better, but it's probably never going to um, serve all the needs that the iPSCs that Bob talked about will ultimately. I think I think that also is going to emerge in tandem so that in we'll look at, look up in five years and almost everything will probably be iPSC. But it's so, it, it's not going to happen real fast. So one of the things we did observe in our, our organoid system is we actually do have uh, stellate cells and um, um, macrophages from those patients that come out when we in our process. And in fact, we're looking to see if we should separate out the hepatocytes alone 
uh, using magnetic uh, bead sorting technology to use those on the chip. But we do, we do have stellate cells and macrophages that come from the patients. Now, as you said, the stellate cells are tricky to work with. They, they can be activated and so on. But to me, if you could have a single source, right, and uh, from the same donor, if you will, and if you can reliably and reproducibly get a yield of non-parenchymal cells um, through iPSC, it seems to me you'd overcome a lot of the challenges that you'll have with different sources. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Think, Linda? yeah. Oh, no, I mean, I, I really, really, I completely, totally agree with you. Okay. I, I think, um, you know, I, I'm, uh, you know, I've worked in liver my whole academic career okay. uh, after after grad school, starting postdoc, but I really have like gone all in for gynecology. So I okay. want the liver problem to be solved, and I keep <laughs> working on liver as long as there's like something useful I can do. But the minute the iPSC solve everything, I'm out. <laughs> you know? And I'll I'll just use them, and I'll make I'll make a you know endometriosis patient's liver from the iPSCs. I'll yeah, I mean, yeah. I'll see that tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. So I'm I'm not. Um, I think the problems are really important for all the reasons you said and, and I said. So I'm optimistic that we'll crack the nut of the IPSC. Uh, and part of it, I think, will be the, these in vitro, uh, the, the MPS technologies, because the flow and the ability to control the microenvironment, we're doing an enormous amount with medium composition right now to enable the organ-organ interactions and to do a better job of modeling liver, uh, true me liver metabolic um, microenvironment. And, and I think a lot of people are doing these kind of things and that, you know, we do need more investment by, um, we do need more investment in this field because I think really having the people that I work with on the systems immunology is so needed to help frame the right way to build these systems. And that NIH hasn't tackled that at all. And um, so, um, yeah, so I think, I think the big thing missing right now is the integration of the real systems immunology. And uh, you know, I didn't talk a whole lot about that today, but it's what we do all the time. Uh, yeah, I, I would agree with that. And, um, you know, I, this is, a, like you say, is is the IPSC going to be the answer? You know, I, that's a simple approach, right? Will we be lucky that we happen to get two or three different cell types that we can use from the same donor, and then we still have to go with a commercial source for others? I mean, it, you know, to be determined, but I liked particularly your work on developing vascular channels um, into these um, into these chip systems because to me that's even more physiologic, right? Yeah. Because the, you know you're getting more to where the way that things that were rec were you know iteratively recapitulating, but you know whether it's endometrium or liver or what have you. And I, I really like that. And as you said, that these the the uh, PDMS system and the emulate and others may fix your ability to do those kinds of things, right? Whereas you're you're a bioengineer and this is the way you think, right? And that's 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 very useful that your approach may end up superseding the, if you will, the first generation chips that we've been using. Yeah, and that's, I, that's my I, sense. Yeah, and actually I, I'm gonna credit Roger Cam, my collaborator at MIT yeah. with being the, the you know, one who developed that approach, but we work very closely together now. And, and again, I, um, I'm very interested in sex dimorphism and liver is sexually dimorphic. We didn't talk about that. We are developing the tools to replicate um, sexually dimorphic uh, steroid hormone concentrations and cycles of them for women. Um, obviously, you know, endometriosis is very influenced by that, but we're actually even launching a whole um, discussion group at MIT in the Boston area, but you can join hybrid um, called sex and immunity. So we're, we're focusing on, there's huge sex dimorphism in immunity in responses to vaccines and in responses to all kinds of infection and, you know, autoimmune diseases, the kinds of diseases that women get on average are different right. Um, right. men. And so, so we're, we're very, very much thinking about that. And of course, liver gates, um, tolerance and immunity so right. you know so i stay interested in liver because it's central to the kinds of things i'm thinking about in terms of sex dimorphism more broadly wonderful thank you both um i am going to launch two other polls that if people have the moment um to complete um it would be great to hear from you i believe i can launch them both at the same time 
Um, I also want to thank the speakers um, again um, for all of their work today, for sharing this information with us, um, for their time, for their effort. Um, it's really wonderful um, to see that um, and to have their expertise here. Um, there was, was another... so fun. It was really yeah. fun. I, I was nervous that I would have anything to say, but you picked very <laughs> talk, so I'm thrilled that I you, you were really nice to invite me. Thank you. Yes, we're so happy to Jillian hear. Jillian has a question. Yeah, Jillian, Jillian, do you want to pipe up? Yeah, actually, um, I think this is this is from one of our, one of our members, Anyi. She asked, in my experience with IPSC derived hepatocytes, they've exhibited low metabolic activity. Did you circumvent this issue because of your use of organoids? Yeah, I mean, that's always uh, of concern. And we're going back and, um, you know, it, it, it takes a while, but I, we've done fairly well. Um, you know, our level of expression, for example, I didn't show you all this data. It's, it's in the paper. And I think Johnny may have put the paper preprint if you're interested. Um, but we got levels of uh, albumin production and P450 expression which were comparable to primary human hepatocytes. So we were pretty happy, but we're still not quite as far along as we would like to be. So that's an issue, I think, in general with the IPSC approach is, you know, what, whatever the organ system is that you're still, you, you need to, you know, get further out. The other thing is that we did our experiments largely, you know, the chip allows you to um, keep them going for up to 28 days. And we, we did them, earlier in the chip life. So, you know, for example, if we were to do it in the latter half of the chip life with possibly a little bit more mature cells, would we see, you know, even more advanced, um, uh, uh, you know, phenotypes in metabolic activity. So I, I agree that's, that's an area where we need to continuously refine and get to the more adult-like um, hepatocyte. Awesome. Linda, do you have anything to add? No, I mean, I, I think, you know, that I, I, I'm not working very closely with the IPSC. I have a, a collaboration with Rudolf Yanish, who is, um, but it's right now not the central thing that I'm doing. So Bob, Bob's the expert. Awesome. Okay, with that, I will go ahead. Um, we're just two minutes over, so I will go ahead and um, let everyone go, let our presenters go. Thank you again. Thank you for attending. Thank you for presenting. Um, and if you're interested in um, hearing more about commercially available systems, um, stay tuned for our workshop on liver MPS, um, as well as um, we will be focusing on another MPS system um, probably in the first quarter of next year as well. We're going to be doing a series of these. Um, and so stay tuned. It'll be exciting to talk about. Um, and I'll definitely follow up with you, Linda, about um, the industry consortium as well um, and give you some contacts for that. So, Beautiful. Thanks so much, Megan. Yeah. And reach out to me anytime. Presenter, nice participant. Job. So fun. Thank you for inviting me. Awesome. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye.